being chased by a rogue Mickey. Crap! <laughs> there he is. We are on our way to the Bonnie and Clyde fan night. And um, we've both seen it before, so this won't be our first time seeing it. And I didn't even sum the intro properly, so one moment. Hello Aeronauts, it's me, Aaron James. That's Mickey Joke Theatre. Oh my god, hey! We're off to see the the um, Buddy and Clyde fan night because we've been invited by the lovely Royal PR. Um, so we've both seen it before recently, so we already know we enjoy it. Um, but we know what happens. Yeah, we know there's some loud noises, points. So we're gonna go watch, film bits that we see, show you bits around it. Also, hi, it's been a while since I didn't put anything on YouTube, so we're giving it a go. So, at the end, like, comment, subscribe to let me know if you like me being back or not. Because that would help. <laughs> Here we go. So I'm trying to pay attention to where we're walking because Mickey is... No, I, I don't. I don't like to pay attention. We're here. We've arrived. My eyes have not adjusted because looking at the screen, I'm walking. It's a lot. Oh, turn, 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 turn. So we are at the Arts in the middle of the West End, literally right by Leicester Square. It's there. It's really, it's one of the smallest West End theatres. Um, it's like a little, a little, 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 little boutique. I think they used to call it a boutique West End theatre, which is really cool. If you didn't know, the Arts was the original West End home of six. Oh, yeah. Having did the trial concerts in there as well, so it, it now has a beloved history as a theatre. And Choir of Man was just in there, and it's coming back. There's a plane between but then it's coming back, so it's all all in here. We're going down. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed the show. Oh. Hi, so I'm Ross, uh, and I'll be uh, helping out with questions uh, today. So we've got a few that people have emailed in, tweeted us, that we'll start with. We'll open it out to the floor as well. You don't have a mic, so you just have to project old stuff. Um, so we can hear you. That should be a fine. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, guys, pick it up uh, as when you want to, and if you don't, then I'll obviously uh, put it on one of you. But the first one I think is um, quite a nice one to start with, is how did you know you wanted to work in theatre? <laughs> well, how did I know? I, from, a, from a young age, that's all I did. I was doing shows at Christmas and cantos and, you know, going to Saturday schools of drama and dance, and that was it. I just knew. I had the bug when I was, I was little, I don't know about anyone else, that, and I love theatre, and um, you know, I, 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 from a young age was doing shows and tap dancing in the bath, <laughs> as, as we all do. Nat, how about you? <laughs> um, uh, I was a show-off. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, just loved showing up and being that, that kid and um, did karaoke in Spain once and the woman was like, you should probably get a singing lesson, which I don't know if that was like a <laughs> 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 oh, You've not got the mic now, so oh, no. <laughs> um, Sorry, it's just marriage, you know? <laughs> no, I was a show off, that's basically it. Anyway. Yeah, good work, Okay. Um, it's so weird because I was I wanted to be a singer, I wanted to be a pop star. And then I was on holiday with my family and I sang karaoke and they were like, oh, we should put her on stage girl. I sang Whitney Houston. <laughs> <laughs> no, Whitney. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just trained and fell into theatre. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think I think it's just like everyone wants to do it, and it's you know it's hard work. It's kind of it's working through that, isn't it? It's bringing your, it's trying to sustain your love for theatre into when you actually get to do it because you know it's like anything else. It's a hard graft. It's lots of work, and it's you know you do lean on that back when you really enjoyed it. And I did it for a long time. I still love it. Um, uh, what's your best stage experience, Jordan, ever? As in, like, best show, or...? Well, either or. This one, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even just saying that, like, genuinely, this is, like, I feel very lucky to be able to play this part and be with this group of people, because everybody's so phenomenal. Um, best stage experience, though, okay, well, if I'm not talking about a show in particular, Probably I performed with Battle of Hell at BBC Proms in the Park. That was amazing. Like Hyde Park on TV, BBC. That was pretty epic. Uh, but definitely this show. I had to pick. What about you, Keith? Ooh. Um, I feel like any time I've been able to be on stage, I've I've always felt like that is the best thing. Like I I just enjoy it. I I think. Uh, a moment or two is when I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to perform at the Olivier's um, and I've done it twice which was amazing and then the second year being able to perform whilst being nominated was like crazy. Um, so yeah, that I think for me was an experience that I will never ever forget. Yeah, pretty special one. Um, <laughs> hey, yeah, we'll move on. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, I, I was in the original cast of uh, Sister Act. Uh, and uh, we had, at the, towards the end, uh, Ruby Goldberg came and joined us. And so sharing time with her on stage was probably one of the most special things I've ever experienced. She was a beautiful person and still is. Yeah. It's always lovely as well, isn't it, when you work with somebody yeah, that is as iconic as that and has been so successful, but they are genuinely lovely people. You know, it's always a lovely, a lovely surprise when that happens. Um, any of you have any pre show rituals? Cleve, Akko? <laughs> Ross has brought this to me. Well, it's not the list, mate. It's not the list. <laughs> because in, in our dressing room, every day at the five, um, the five is, is when we get our five minute call before we have to come down for the show, we play a song called Ain't No Fish. Classic. Classic. I'm done working, darling. I'm working. <laughs> but you, you, like, for those of you who, who are like who follow the, the Bonnie and Clyde Instagram account, you will have probably seen a, a video or a couple of videos of the dressing room and the song annoys the hell out of everyone. <laughs> so, job done. <laughs> Pretty sure ritual. Um, uh, what's your favourite song? to sing in the show? Or your favourite song in the show? Okay. Uh, I've got three. <laughs> okay. Three <laughs> keys. My favourite solo song is definitely Raise a Little Hell. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, just because of the journey and the, the notes is pretty good. Cool. Uh, and then it, a duet. It would be mine and Frankie's Too Late to Turn Back Now, I love, love singing that. And also When I Drive is, is, is my third. But I also like... Uh, <laughs> I also like the other duet that we sing in that too. I like the finale. <laughs> so you can see why this is your favourite show. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Frankie? Um, I love to listen to When I Drive. Yeah. And... Also, raise a little hell. I love watching it inside. You have to say one of yours because now I sound narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> I do, okay? It's because I get to stand at the side and enjoy it. We get to dance. We do. We have a whole routine. <laughs> beginning and this humble beginnings in a diner and then falling in love with Clyde and just going down this path and there's no going back. It's, it, there's not many roles like it where you get to have this full journey but also because she's a real person, she existed so I have all this material to work from 
Yeah. Which is amazing. So I get to have the facts, but also make it my own. Um, which is really nice because sometimes, you know, when it's a fictional character, you get to do it you, all by yourself, but to have the material there to work from already is really incredible. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite lovely. Look, a lot of the time when we were in rehearsals, and we would talk about like pictures that we've seen or stories that we've heard, and we'd talk about that collaboration and kind of be like, oh, you know, in this picture, do you think this is where that happened or do you think mm -hmm. that is? It's, it's quite lovely to have, to have something to leave on, isn't it? Now, what about you? What, what excites you about telling the story? Um, well, for me, like, personally, I'm always, and in the show, playing or wanting to play comedy. <laughs> um, but I really love that in this show, for the first time ever, I get to have that really dramatic ending. Um, and she has a very unique story because she really is going along because she wants to go for her husband. She's not going because she wants to hurt anyone or she wants to, you know, steal from anybody. She's going for love and, um, you know, she's a bit of a uh, nightmare. But I do like that at the end she gets that really nice moment and I think she gives it, um, she's hopefully not not me doing it but just that 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 role she grounds it when everything's going crazy around her um she, she's she's there because she wants to um make him better and and not uh i don't know what i'm trying to say no, yeah, I, I, I remember I, yeah, I remember in your house we had, you know what this, to say? we had a discussion about you know you wanting to earn that moment at the end and making yeah. sure the audience with you and i do think uh, especially with with Blanche and Buck, they love each other. Despite they're never really arguing at each other, they're never really going for each other. Yeah. They're always united in everything yeah. that they do, you know. Yeah. And, and the hardships of the depression of the situation they're in. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you know, she's she's all right. She's got a business. She's a nightmare, but for a reason. Yeah. She's you know, it's it's because she doesn't want him to do this. Yeah. Um and. She doesn't like them because he wants to do it because of them. Yeah, and there, and there is a George. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think he also. He wants to do it for her. There's a bit of a myth. He, he looks up, well, he looks up to his younger brother. <laughs> and, you know, he idolises Clyde. And uh, as most people do, Clyde has this magnetism that just that, that's what he was like in real life. And that's what we have in this show. So I think, but what Buck is torn by is the, you know, he just wants, he wants the ordinary life. He wants to, he loves Blanche. He wants that, but he wants not only better for them but also the thrill and the, the, the what, what Clyde has but he could never be Clyde I don't think um, and he and he dies you know they all, <laughs> sorry no one's seen they, they all have, they're all dead now um, so it's true so that's it next question I'll, I'll, I'll open up the audience in a minute but I'm, uh, look, we had a lot of questions about because it is such a big seeing and such a demanding show for everyone here I'm like, how do you, are there things you do to look after your voices? How do you look after yourself when doing a show? It's something that quite a lot of people are interested in. Let's go over this way. <laughs> uh, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> no. no. No, I mean, uh, the, the vocals in this show, we can all attest to that, are really demanding. They're almost unreasonable. <laughs> and. Uh, so uh, I personally, I just, I, I love wine, <laughs> but I don't have it. <laughs> At all, I don't have it. I have one on Sunday, and, really like wine, and that's okay. So, you know, it's just, you just got to take care of yourself. I guess, and hydrate. <laughs> um, uh, quite a few of us have nebulizers. Um, so we're constantly steaming um, backstage, and then, like for myself, I'll go home and, and steam, wake up and steam, <laughs> in the shower steaming, and, then, and they're just drinking as much water as possible. Honestly, water is a lifesaver. And it works differently for everyone, you know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of the guys about it, and it, it's different to every person, you, you have to find a way that works for you, you know, for some people that is doing their own vocal warm up, for some people that is, you know, taking care of it, I mean, you know, going back to the work ethic on a show like this, you know, you really do live the show, 
Do you know what I mean? You go to bed, you wake up, and you think, I hope I can sing today, not me, but maybe. <laughs> um, and so really important. Like, Jordan Lamb, have you got any special things to do? No, you, no, you pretty much covered it. I do drink wine quite a lot. <laughs> but uh, I drink a lot of water, which balances it out. Um, yeah, for me it's just making sure I'm staying hydrated. Um, I try and not do too much of a warm-up, because someone told me once if you warm up too much, then you're kind of like leaving your best notes in your dressing room, and then you've worn yourself out. So I try and keep my warm-up to a minimum. Um, but yeah, we kind of all are like the nebulizer crew, we're all like stage <laughs> yeah. Uh And yeah, just like taking it easy, like, that's the thing, when you're doing eight, we do seven shows a week. Um, when you're performing this much a week, it's actually behind the scenes where you're putting in so much work. Like, your lifestyle does change as a performer, you can't be going out to parties every weekend and doing like, all, all that kind of thing, so you kind of, your social life might suffer slightly, but it's because you're putting in the, the work to make this as good as it possibly can be. Yeah, and, and likewise, you know, for the guys that understudy these guys, you know, you can be thrown on a moment's notice, so, you know, they've all got their own routine as well. Um, has anyone got a question? Yeah. Um, what is it about this show that you think connects so powerfully with specifically, like, young adult audiences? Yeah, great question, Frankie. Um, I think, for one, Bonnie and Clyde themselves were young. And, you know, in the Great Depression, um, there was nothing else to do, so they, they found their own path. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they made their own lives, even though it was the wrong lane to go down. Like, it's exciting, and every, that's why people admired them, because it's like, yeah, they just said, you know, there might be a depression, but we're going to go out and live the life that we want and have the things that we want. So. There is something admirable in that, but um, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's kind of just following on like, there's, people love a story, the story of the underdog, and like people that are standing up to society and like rebelling against the police and the government, and so that's why kind of at the time they became so famous and adored, even though they were in the newspapers committing these crimes, is because they were seen as as the heroes who were standing up for the general public, in, in a way, which doesn't excuse what they did. That's right. <laughs> um, but I feel like that's kind of why the younger generation do kind of gravitate towards it, is because um, we all love a story of people standing up against society. And yeah, sadly, you know, I think not much has changed, even though such a long time has passed. You know, we've seen it during the pandemic and stuff, how, you know, the, the young one of voice. I've got two adult children myself that are 18, so I don't look at that. I'm too, too young. Really. I, you know, but, but, you know, I do see, I think, that the correlation with regards to, you know, the struggle that, that is in this play and in this piece. And, you know, if we see it with youth now, they want a voice and they are being heard. It's a really great question. I think the music. I think the music. Do you know, I think that it's it's got this score that is just hooks you in and and is instantly sort of uh, moving and catchy and uh, cool and also of the time but modern at the yeah. same time, which is amazing. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's that's the thing that that really struck me first of all that the score was just um, very unique and, and brilliant and really captured these people. And, and, and what was going on, yeah. yeah. And also, sorry, just to add on. <laughs> um, I feel like people love a history lesson in a musical these days, like Six, Hamilton, this. So I feel like people like to come to the theatre and learn something, so maybe that's also where the younger generation... It was actually a discussion that um, I had with Nick in the audition process about uh, Nick Winston directing choreographer, about, about the show and about what he wanted to achieve with it. And one thing that was really clear is that he wanted to... Um, to, to have it as it was and not, you know, not just a musical, but to have the grit and the, the hardship and the violence that was attached to him. I think that, you know, that is all exciting, you know, whether it's right or wrong, it, it's an exciting subject to, to put on stage. And I think that's been done really neat by Nick on this. Um, yeah? Um, if you could play one other character, regardless of gender, what would it be and why? <laughs> yeah, <big shot. laughs> uh, it's a hard question. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, to be honest, 
this, me and Frankie really, really want to do a version of When I Drive. So I think I would be Buck and you would be Clive. Let's do it. Yeah? Shall we? Oh, great. Someone get the tyre. <laughs> Someone said, now. <laughs> I think it's difficult because... I think, I think it's difficult to answer because all the parts are so great. Like, I wouldn't be happy to play any of them, to be honest. I'd give Bonnie a go. Last one. Another question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my daughter's really into Harry Potter. Yeah, so I literally have to say Gryffindor, so otherwise I'd be in trouble. And then I think that would probably be like, um, I don't know, the Hufflepuff, wouldn't you? Wants to be a Gryffindor and the hat just goes, nah. <laughs> the um, well, I'm, re I'm genuinely sorry for what I'm about to say. I, I've not really seen... I'm so... <laughs> <laughs> however, <laughs> however, my boyfriend and I went to Universal and... Uh, apparent, sorry? I'm literally like, I'm not sorry, but I think I'd be the... Well, look, I mean, look at me. <laughs> Baby, we slivery. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that one. Blanche would be a Gryffindor. Do you think? Yeah. She's got a good heart. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see Slytherin. <laughs> Slytherin. 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 Yeah. Let's be Slytherin together. <laughs> yeah, I guess Slytherin because that's the evil house, right? So. <laughs> but then they're not evil. They do have good hearts, they just get wrapped up. Mm. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> 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 uh, I, Gryffindor, I guess, Ted would be Gryffindor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very old. <laughs> I heard the first part. Say that again. What advice would you give someone they wanting to study or, or work in the industry? Um, I mean, there's there's so much. I, I think one of the first things about the industry is it's it's hard work. Um, there's a lot of work that you have to put in, and I feel for myself, uh, and I can't, I can't speak for anyone else, but for myself, I feel like you have to genuinely love what you do. You have to love this, because there is so much that this industry will put you through, um, that that love for it has to overpower um, any whatever negative things might be pushed towards you. Um, but be a sponge, take everything in, learn as much as you can, and then what works for you, use it. What doesn't work for you, call great, set it aside. Um, and just remember that it's fun. Like, don't ever forget that that you do this because you love doing it. Yeah, I kind of, well, just everything that you said. Um, and to, I think if I could go back when I was like starting in the industry, I would just kind of tell myself to not compare myself or my journey to other people's around me because for some people it might happen really quickly um, and for some people it takes a little bit longer. But I just truly believe that if you have this self-belief and you work hard, then anything you can achieve anything in life. So that's kind of... Where I stand on that. Just always be be good to other people and, and, and be honest to be yourself. I think that's the one thing that um, you know sometimes actors get a bad name and you know people can be sort of I, you often hear that like I met this actor and they were really nice. <laughs> I'm surprised because actually sometimes actors can be bad. But I think if you if you do what you do because you love it. 
but also you just treat other people with respect and you, you know, know yourself and you're a good person, then it will come back round and people will want to work with you and, and, and that's important as well. I always think the people that work the hardest are in the nicest workplace. That's, that's it. That's it. Um, someone else from up the top? Yep, yeah, at the back. Yeah, for you. Yeah. Um, what's your, your favourite on or off stage moment you've had on the show so far? Oh, I've got to say. <laughs> so, um, there's a scene where me and Nat come on. Um, oh my uh, god! And it's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh no! And it's just after. Um, after Ted and um, Barney sing a song, you know, very nice things and ice cream parlor and all of that. And uh, we're side stage and our sort of music starts, our scene change music, and it's kind of like... Dim, 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 dim. It's kind of like sort of Western. And I decided just for the bit where you can't see us as we're about to come in the wings to sort of gallop on the wall. As I was singing it, I stepped on Nat's foot. We need to be I, yeah, so I, 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 I turned around, so turn around to see if she was okay and went, come. I butted her so hard. It was so loud, the noise was like two bits of bone hitting each other. And then we had to come on stage and we had to laughing. And it was like, we it, we cracked heads. Breakages, yeah. That was a highlight for me. <laughs> it was like um, Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> yeah, like the comedy duo on and what off stage. And <laughs> 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 um, on the first preview. Uh, <laughs> at, the end, <laughs> at the end where we where we get into the car and we've just been shot <laughs> and then the door wouldn't close. <laughs> so I closed the door, we were sitting and then we turned around and we're dead and I could see the door had swung. <laughs> and then uh, what I should have done is just left the door. But anyway, and I, I, I don't know the stage well enough, so I thought maybe something could fly in and knock the door off. So so I was dead and I literally went. If you make loads of loads of demands for it, then it will definitely happen. Um, but, yeah. When you were researching the lives of the real people, was there anything that surprised you about them that maybe changed how you were going to approach them? Uh, I think uh, because you know we did the concert. Yeah. And then having a full rehearsal period coming into the show was amazing. Um, so I had the chance to do more research and find new things and just, you know, create a more well-rounded character. And there was a part in a book uh, that uh, I really hope the book gave us. Um, and it was about how Bonnie, when she was younger, was just, like, fearless and she would always ready for a fight. <laughs> and like if you say something bad to her, she's in there, like you're knocked out. So reading that, I was like, oh, I love that. Where when Blanche says that line, like, yeah, yeah, like she would go for it. Mm -hmm. She I would take it out. I see you in that scene. I think when you do when you walk up to me. So it's nice, like I get to feel like you know she's a bit sweet, and then she switches, yeah. and then it's just like a whole yeah, yeah. roller coaster of yeah. the journey. Please. Um, I, I, I did quite a bit of research on Ted and when I, when I had initially read the role of Ted within the, the script, he felt, uh, it, he felt a bit like he was just 
make, putting himself in spaces without like people giving him permission to be there, like just entering Bonnie's house and all of this kind of stuff. And I, and I felt that that character, the characterization of that was a bit odd. And then I read into Ted, and Ted was actually a really lovely human being um, from from the beginning part. Him, him actually knowing Bonnie and how respectful he was towards her. He never really actually made a, a, like. Uh, uh, I mean, he never stepped towards her and, and said anything um, that would have, I don't know, I guess been how Clyde was. Um, so I just tried to, to embody that and try and bring as much of that um, kindness um, into the character uh, and to make it him seem a little less weird and obsessed. <laughs> I mean, he still is a little bit obsessed, but but I I love the fact that they they've written um, what what we call the ice cream song, which is um, the new duet between <laughs> between Bonnie and Ted, um, because it gives a little bit of context to their friendship, um, so it doesn't all seem as obsessive. <laughs> I, I think it's fair to say as well that um, the people who pass they pass over, I think. Yeah. Um, but I think it's fair to say that um, you, you can. As actors, you consistently discover more stuff as you do a show and as you go along with the show. But on this one, you know, you've got to double check it. Like, would that would that be true? So sometimes, you know, someone will discuss something and remember that saying to me, "Why did he say deputy at that point?" And I was like, "Oh," and then we had to look at it. Like, oh, there's always more than one deputy. So it's you know the finite details that make you question a certain thing. But we have a lot of literature to wade through to make sure that the decisions we make are worthy of, of that choice. Loads of photos too. Like and that's and that's the same for everyone in the cast you know even the the parts you see for ac you know there's a wealth of of discovery to be had on you know the governess or Hamo or uh, the sheriff you know and it's really exciting reading all yeah, that stuff the character has a great Series that we were talking about the high room with yeah. Kevin Costner and yeah. uh, Woody Harrelson. Great I watched film, yeah. it's like amazing. Yeah. Like they brought him back from retirement and came in to hunt them down. Yeah. It's like and very and actually when I was um, reading about Hamer, he was nearly Clyde. Like they both, I think, had seven. They're one of seven siblings. And uh, there was a, a a particular night when Hamer was going to make um, uh, a robbery on a bank. And somebody stopped that night, and he says, it could have been me. I was stopped that night, and I went down the path of catching people like Clyde. But he could have very easily have, have been Clyde. So it's, you know, it's, it's tiny margins in all those characters of making sure that you do service to. Yeah? So my question for all of you is sort of about like, the process. So I was just wondering, sort of, you all presumably have like a breadth of experience with acting, but I was wondering how it differs creating a character who's completely fictional, or maybe based on a movie, or Versus somebody with that backstory and almost a homage to history, like does it uh, almost like limit the creativity that you have because you have to follow like sort of a perception of him or her, or does it expand it almost? I mean, it's an interesting question because it, it depends on uh, yeah, Bonnie and Clyde and this whole story are, are people that have been um, dramatised and and, and romanticised since even when they were doing this, you know, they became sort of um, folk legends and heroes. You know, if you're playing someone that is popular in, in modern culture, then I suppose people want to see a likeness or a... But actually, for something like this, I think it's about doing all the research, finding out as much as you can, and then just capturing the spirit of that person and portraying a role on stage that people get. I don't think, you know, because no one here, you know, people don't know what exactly what they were like. You know, we're, we're retelling a story that's been retold and retold and retold. And, um, yeah, I think it's it, to be able to do your own interpretation is quite important as actors. I think. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, well, yeah, like um, in the past, for me, I've played a role that's kind of so heavily based on a real person that, like, I ended up driving myself kind of crazy because I was like, it needs to be kind of really someone that everybody, you know someone that people do and it could be like this for this but I think you like you say if you capture the spirit and it does it it becomes its own thing and how 
you react with other version, the, the other actors' versions of their characters, and it, I hopefully if you've got that spirit of the character and the truth, um, then hopefully it, it comes across okay. Why am I making any sense? Yeah. <laughs> Look, well, that's it, guys. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for coming to see the show. Thank you for supporting it. Thank you to all of you that have dressed up and to continue to come back night after night. Um, We've extremely fortunate to, you know, be selling out as as well as we are, and extremely uh, happy and, and proud that it has touched uh, a lot of people in in the way that it has, especially you know people that are fans of musicals and uh, people that are fans of of the work that we do. So thank you for all of that. I hope tonight uh, the show was great. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed meeting everyone this evening. Uh, that's it. Over and out. Thank you. Very much. Hello, so we have made it back. Um, we sneakily snuck out of the show to ride the Elizabeth line because it's the first day of it, so we were like, ah, so we weren't sure. Um, and we got a Mickey. Reveal. <laughs> we got, what did we get, Mickey? We got t-shirts with the new logo on because I had the existing logo, but this is the new logo. Look, it's so much bigger. Ah, oh, look, bam, glow up, bam. So I just have the glow up. Reveal. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what did you think? I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it even more the second time. I really enjoyed it from that close because you could see all of the emotion. Like you could count the individual veins popping out of Jordan Luke Cage's head. Although I would say if you're smaller, maybe go like five rows back rather than three rows back because your neck can get a little cricked. Oh, I did have a little bit of a neck crick thing. Yeah, but the only thing I would say in the arts is if you're a bit too far forward, your neck will be a bit like eek, eek. It's a trade-off. It depends on the kind of theatrical experience you want and the level of pain that you're willing to experience. And if you don't like big bangs, there's a couple of moments you might want to put your hand here, here. But uh, the Q&A was really interesting, actually, and we both got to ask questions. We did. We did. We asked um, some questions, prompted some interesting discussion points. So it was really nice, actually, to learn new things about the show that changes how you view things, especially as it's based on real people. Yeah. Um, and I always love a cheeky bit of off-stage mishaps or on-stage mishaps. There might have been a couple tonight. Oh, what with the with the with the with the dollar bill mm -hmm. landing on Francis's face, <laughs> and the door, yeah, okay. and the door and the door, but she wasn't dead while closing a door. That's very true. So that's that's better. That's better. It wasn't a ghost door. I really enjoyed seeing so many other um, YouTube peoples. Yeah, it was really nice actually. So many friends were there. Yep, loads of theatre bloggers and theatre bloggers, and even people we haven't seen recently, which was nice. Yep, Amy Lovett was there. Sam for God was there. Ellie talks theatre. Sam? Sam? Yeah, Sam was there. <laughs> yeah. um, Dad, Sean. It was nice. It was a nice big group. I group, think a few of them group. are going to be making videos about this as well, um, so you can go and check out those. Yep. You can follow this one at Mickey Joe Theatre. Uh... And just, you know, like I said at the start, like, comment, subscribe, and I'm talking in a lighter voice and quieter because it's late. It's very late. And I don't want Why to. is it very late, Aaron? Because we went on the Elizabeth line. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so worth it. There's only how many people in the world that are ever going to be able to say they did the first day of a brand new tube line opening. But it's not a tube line, it's actually a railway. Fun fact. But it's the Elizabeth line. So I think it was fine that we ended up on a later train. You know, it was worth it. We're back in London tomorrow. <laughs> so join us for more vlogs soon. And if you like this video, let us know so we know that we we should upload stuff on this channel and not just on this one. Bye. Bye.